So the Wolf Moose Research Project on Isle Royale National Park is the longest study of its kind. It's the longest continuous study of any predator prey system in the world. It began in the year 1959, so we're into the sixth decade of research now. And for that entire time span, uh, the focus of the research project has always been the same, which is to understand how and why wolf and moose populations fluctuate the way they do. Uh, the wolves eat the moose, and the primary cause of death for moose would be being killed by a wolf. And so we want to understand in years in which there are more moose, why is that the case? Does it got something to do with the wolves or does it have things to do with maybe how much food the moose have or climate or something like that? So anyways, that's the, the basic idea of the project is to understand the population dynamics of wolves and moose. And so on Isle Royale, you have a food chain with wolves being the predator at the top and they're the only species that are at that position. And then you have moose that are the large herbivore. They're the only species at that position. And then you have obviously an awful lot of vegetation that they're eating different species. But the fact that you'd have a single predator and a single prey, that's relatively rare in most parts of the world. The work we do on Isle Royale, especially with the wolves, is, is relevant to life other places, quite a few other places besides Isle Royale because uh, carnivore conservation around the world is a, is a challenging endeavor. Carnivores are not doing well, and there's an interest to help do better by them. One of the things that we expect and hope for in reintroducing wolves is that uh, it will keep the moose population from growing to such large numbers as to have a kind of adverse impacts on the forest. Here's what one of the potentially worst outcomes could be is that moose could eat enough food in the absence of wolves that would actually impair the food supply for the moose themselves. If that were the case, then Isle Royale wouldn't be able to support going into the future as many moose as they have been up until now. If you reduce the number of moose that can be supported on, on Isle Royale, it becomes possible that you can't even support enough wolves to keep that population going. So it's important to protect the food supply for moose and one of the ways to do that is to make sure there's a healthy wolf population in this case. Isle Royale is special for another reason, and it has to do with the nature of the food chain that's there. You have these top predators, the wolves, you have the large herbivore, the moose, and then you have the forest. Well, in this particular case, the wolves are not persecuted by humans, the moose are not hunted, and the forest is not logged. That is likely the last forest in the Northern Hemisphere where that's the case. Even places like Yellowstone, the elk are hunted when they leave the park every year, and the wolves are persecuted by humans um, when they leave the park as well. And so, so Isle Royale, in part because it's an island, is uh, really special uh, for having this level of protection. So there have been uh, some important patterns that we've been able to detect in the fluctuations of wolf moose abundance on Isle Royale over the past six decades. And I'm going to be able to describe them in ways that are relevant for lots of populations, just not particular to Isle Royale. First thing is that there are average abundances. And for moose, there have uh, been about maybe 1,000 or 1,200 moose as average. And for wolves, a couple dozen. But over many decades, what's really important about that is they fluctuate greatly. So wolves often are as low as 12 or 15, often as high as 30, 35. So they fluctuate a great deal. And so too can the moose populations. So we shouldn't be alarmed when on, in other populations we see that they fluctuate. That's just what they do. The next thing that we've learned is uh, in more recent decades, the last uh, 10 or 15 years, is that the wolf population in particular has declined to really dangerously low levels. Dangerous for the wolf population. They're right on the brink of extinction right now. At the moment, in 2018, there are only two wolves left on Isle Royale. And because there were so few wolves, there are also a very large number of moose on Isle Royale. Moose have increased by more than threefold in the last 10 years. And so what's the explanation for all of this? What we know is that the wolf population has declined mainly because of inbreeding depression. Isle Royale is not a very big island, which means on average there aren't very many wolves, just a couple dozen. And so that means the population of wolves is always at risk of inbreeding. And when a population gets too inbred, it can start to not perform very well. The animals don't live as long, they don't reproduce as well, and the population declines in abundance. Now that's always been the case, but this reduced abundance has only been relatively recent. The explanation for that has to do with things that we really didn't learn until about the last uh, 10 years or so. And it has to do with the following. 
is that ice bridges have formed from time to time on Isle Royale. They connect Isle Royale to the mainland, mostly Canada, but also to Minnesota. And when those ice bridges form, well then sometimes a wolf will come from the mainland to Isle Royale. And that provides an infusion of new genes and that um, mitigates this inbreeding that I was mentioning just a moment ago. Here's the concern, and it's tied to climate warming, is that in the 1960s, for example, ice bridges formed in about three out of every four winters. And today, ice bridges now form, on average, about once a decade. And so that reduction in the frequency of ice bridges is attributable to climate warming, and that has reduced the amount of immigrants that come, come from the mainland to Isle Royale. That's led to more inbreeding, and then the situation that we find ourselves in today, which is very, very few wolves, the two wolves that we're, are there now, we believe that they'll be the last two wolves on Isle Royal until the Park Service decides to um, act on their plans, which is to reintroduce wolves. And um, that's where we're at today. So what we've been able to understand about how frequently wolves come to Isle Royal has been a couple of things. This is an interesting thing about long-term research because you don't always learn things in the order in which they occurred. You learn them in the order in which the clues are revealed to you, so to speak. So one of the things that we discovered in about the year 2009 is that a wolf had come to Isle Royale from the mainland. It was the first kind of uh, really hardcore demonstration that such a thing had occurred. We documented it through DNA. What happens is every year we collect fecal samples of wolves. They leave fecal samples all over their kill sites and we collect them all. And then we get DNA fingerprints from these samples. In doing so, we found there was a wolf that didn't belong to the Isle Royale population. It actually came from Canada. We didn't learn that till 2000. In a, it was about 2009, 2011 is when we learned it. But it occurred in 1997. And that just had to do with the fact that we collect fecal samples at a rate far faster than we could afford to analyze them in the laboratory. That was our first clue that things were maybe not always the way that we had thought. The other thing we learned along with this is that the population hadn't been doing very well genetically just prior to this immigrant's arrival, and then the population started doing much better afterward, but that improved benefit of the immigrant was short-lived, and that led to the population's kind of declined period that we're in right now. Everything that I just described to you is like the last 15, 20 years. What about all those decades prior? We only know two facts about the decades prior. One is the ice bridges were far more frequent. The other thing that we know, this is a little bit technical, but it's kind of an important part of the, the story, is that we can compare the genetic diversity of Isle Royale wolves with mainland wolves. And in that comparison, we know how much genetic diversity Isle Royale wolves should have lost if they were truly isolated all that time. But they didn't lose that much. They actually had retained much more than we ever would have guessed. The only way they could have retained that much is, and here's kind of the, the, the final analysis, is if they had received an immigrant maybe something like once, once a decade. And so, so for those reasons, we believe throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s, they were receiving immigrants about once a decade, most recently in the late 90s. And that's the last one we think they received. And they benefited from that for a while. And now that benefit has passed. And we're left now with this situation there's fewer immigrants, far fewer immigrants, essentially nil, because there are no ice bridges. And there end up being only two choices, two choices for the National Park Service. One is to um, think that that situation is okay, in which case the population of wolves will dwindle to zero, the moose population will increase greatly, have long-term impacts on the forest, and we could all decide that that's just fine. The other option that the Park Service has is to decide that that's not appropriate, and that uh, it would be a good idea to bring wolves back to Isle Royale. Wolves to do well in perpetuity on Isle Royale, they'll need more than a one-time infusion of genetic diversity. They'll have to have an, an occasional immigrant from time to time. There's no other way about it. How frequently? It's not known for sure. It might be something like once every 10 to 20 years. The science on that is, is pretty clear, and it's hard to imagine that we'd learn new science that would make us think differently in the future. At the same time, the Park Service has uh, made a decision uh, to bring wolves on a one-time basis, but this is an important uh, kind of qualification to their decision. They also have like a time horizon on their decision frame, which is the next 20 years. And uh, that's pragmatic, I think. Um, what life is like 
20 years out from now is very different. We are liable to know different things that give us a different sense about how to uh, manage wolves and IRO. Many things could be different. And so it's, it's sensible to think both things at the same time, to have a one-time uh, infusion of a genetic diversity for a fixed time horizon, and at the same time to, to be understanding that for wolves to do well in perpetuity, they'll have to have regular infusions of genetic diversity. This decision is important because it has implications far beyond Isle Royal. And one of the main implications has to do with what should our national parks do in the face of climate change? If climate change takes something away from our national parks, this could be sequoia trees in Sequoia National Park or Joshua trees, there's many other national parks where things are at risk of being lost from climate change. If climate change takes those things away, do we just say, well, that's just the way that it is? Or when it's feasible to restore it or maintain it, should we? That's the big question here that Isle Royal represents. So what lies ahead? What are the policy challenges? What are the uh, really challenges to philosophy? Philosophy about how we respond and re relate to nature uh, coming up in the future. You know, the National Park Service still doesn't have a completely unified, unified philosophy about how to respond to climate change. They don't have that because we as an American people don't have a unified view on how to respond to climate change. That's what we need desperately. And the concerns that we see in the Isle Royal case is that it was a relatively easy decision to make. The harm that was about to be created, it even started to be created, was clear. The fix for it was really pretty straightforward. And that contrasts with other cases that are liable to be quite a bit more difficult. And, uh, and you know, we're gonna have to be better about making those decisions in the future. We're gonna have to kind of understand the answers to difficult questions about our relationship with nature. And so I think that's what lies ahead in the future.